Chester. Uh, okay, so as we start here, I wanna ask you this. What has been your understanding and involvement with the book of Revelation? How much experience do you have with this book? And I'm gonna guess, okay? So there's, we come probably from a bunch of different camps, but there's really two ends of the spectrum. One is it scares me, it creeps me out. I don't wanna read it or think about it. And, and, and if that's you, you might not even be here this morning because you're going, I'll see you when you're done, <laughs> right? Like, and, and it's almost like it's so scary and it's, it, there's so much in it that it just makes me, just, it just makes me nervous and I don't want to think about it. All right, there's one, that's one camp. And then, and then another camp is, 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 is a, people who would say, I think I have it figured out. If you come to my basement, you'll see my charts and my diagrams, and I'm currently writing my third book on Revelation. And you're going like, okay, you're in it. You are all in. Here we go. And you, know, right, you have an understanding. There. And then everyone in between, right? And then there's the rest of us going like, I, I have a good understanding. I've read a lot. I'm currently reading, or I've read some stuff in the past, or I've taken a prayer, or, or like, well, all right, wherever you are, okay, wherever you are with your understanding of the book of Revelation, let me just encourage you by saying you're in the right place being here on Sundays. That wherever you are, you're going to walk away saying, okay, I f- this is my goal. That we walk away saying, I feel, uh, I, I, I know more now. I've, I've, I th- I, I'm learning stuff. I'm being challenged in my understanding. Even though sometimes you might not agree or be like, I don't know if I take that view of it. Hey, that's fine. You'll, or at least being exposed to, uh, to like, what, like the, the, what revelation is and what it's meant and, and how people view it. And the third one, here, this is, my, this is the one I'm really gonna land on, that you will be encouraged. That you will literally have more courage in you because we've gone through this together. And you realize it's more than just a book uh, about you know, trying, to, trying to decipher it all, but it really is something that I can look at and apply to my life and, and have it change me today. So if you come to Revelation in our series, trying to, to, th- I can promise you this. I can promise you, if you're coming to say, just tell me what everything means, and I just want to know, what is the mark of the beast so I don't accidentally get it? Can you just tell me that so that I know? And if, that's, if you're here going like, just tell me all, how all the puzzle pieces fit and give me the diagram, and then I'll be like, yeah, that's how it works. That's not what we're doing. What we're not doing is here's like how every piece fits together together according to Brandon, and so therefore, you know, which is also the right way, so, so you'll get the correct view. But, but the, goal is not, the goal is not that you leave this summer going like, now I know. The goal is, all right, but now I feel it. Now I feel what John was writing and the why behind it. And it's, and it's causing me to actually maybe live differently and to, and to have more courage to put, to put steel in my spine. That's the goal of Revelation. It isn't so that you would just have a, a really good understanding so you, know, you can have good conversations with people. The goal is that you would experience it, that it would change you. So I'm also gonna guess this, that many of us, many of us, um, our exposure to revelation is through other sources. And a primary source, I'm gonna guess, even though we're a few years removed from it now, I'm gonna guess a primary source of your understanding of theology and eschatology and revelation comes from left behind, right? Your understanding of end times isn't what you read in the Bible. It's not that you read revelation. It's that you read a story about, a, about a end times, how it could happen. And you're going, oh, that must be how it works. And, and so some of this will be a little bit of this honestly will be a little bit of deprogramming and reprogramming to say we're going to read the Bible and we're going to let the Bible tell us what it says. We're going to interpret Scripture through Scripture, not through the lens of you know someone else's story about it or what this theologian said must be or this. Pa- I heard this pastor once say this is what it means, and we're going to say okay, I get that. There's so m- thousands of views. Everyone's got to take, but but let's interpret scripture through scripture. So what we're gonna do this morning is, is an intro to this whole series and it's gonna be foundational. It's gonna be a lot of background and I'm gonna give you, um, I'm gonna give you a way to understand and read Revelation instead of just saying, here's what it all means. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna walk through this together. We're gonna enjoy this journey this summer together 
and, um, and we're, gonna, um, we're gonna learn and discover things together, and we're gonna, we're gonna realize that, that maybe how we've approached Revelation hasn't been the right way or the most responsible way um, biblically. That, so for instance, here we go, ready? Here's the fir- one of the first details that you're gonna go, what? Huh, okay, he must be making that up. I promise you I'm not making it up. Okay, Revelation was not written chronologically. It's not written in chronological time where you have an order of chapter one happens and then two and then three and it's all time lined out. Revelation is a series of visions that were given to John and he writes them in the order he received the visions, but the visions themselves are not and then this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. So what we get is, we, you'll, see, you'll see key phrases throughout Revelation. It'll say, and then I saw, or and then I had a vision, or and next I saw. And, and what he's saying is not, here's the order of all of the events, because when you read them and you realize the events, you're going, man, that one, what you just described happened decades earlier, decades earlier. So we were, we were here, and now we just went backwards, and then the next section, we jump forward again. So so it's not chronological. This, again, this is why, what, what, why it's hard to, to like read Revelation. And, and when you get into it, why people have such a difficult time, because you're reading it thinking this is a novel. This is not a novel that you go, all right, chapter one, we're getting the characters, right? We're just learning who they are, who's married to who, and you know, like who doesn't like who, and then everything's fine. And then, all right, chapter two comes. Now we got some conflict, all right? Revelation is not that. Revelation is a series of of visions that, that John gets. Think of it like windows. He gets a window into this vision and he says, all right, here's what I saw. And he writes down this vision. And then he says, and, and then next I saw, and it's another window into a different vision. And these visions are written in order that he got them, but they're not written necessarily in the order that they will actually happen. You see why revelation is then complicated and why people would say, well, man, this is really hard to understand. Not to mention, is it not only not written chronologically in, in, in like a timeline order, many commentators come to the realization or like will say like, hey, given its structure, it's probably, it's probably actually describing the same events from different angles. So it's not this and then this and then this and this. It's this, and I see it from this angle. And his next vision is, and then I saw a vision, and I saw the same, the same set of events from this angle. And then I saw the same set of events, and again, from another angle. And, and really, it, it's, generally speaking, you can see that, that, um, that Revelation is three sets of sevens, and all of them have a pattern. And it ends with, it ends with judgment and then, the, and then with the, the victory of Jesus. And so commentators will look at this and say, this probably isn't three things happening, like all these events, and then, and then there's a battle, and then Jesus wins. And then we start over and there's another three of these things and then another battle. It's probably the same kinds of things that John is describing from three different angles. All right. Now, again, how you view Revelation will determine kind of how you interpret these. And so this will be challenging in a way that, that it, might, like, it might not be what you've always heard or, ta- or been taught or told or, you know, you know, you read this book once and it said something different. I get that. And what we're gonna do, try to do is, is understand scripture from scripture. So let's look at the details of Revelation and then we'll get into some background. And, and if you're a note taker, you know, make sure you got ink in your pen because we got a lot today. All right, here we go. Okay, first, some details of Revelation. It was written by John the Apostle. John the Apostle also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, also the Gospel of John. So John, this is the John, right? The guy. It was written, uh, probably, most commentators will agree, written in 95 A.D., Um, though some, some who take an earlier view will say probably maybe in 67, 68, uh, before 70, 70 is a big year. Uh, certainly there's a lot happening. We'll talk here in a second. And so they'll early date it though. Most, most scholars, most people will look at it. Certainly modern commentators will look at it and say, most of the evidence points to a 95 AD writing. Now here's why that is awesome. Ready? John is probably about that age. He's probably in, he's certainly in his nineties. Jesus was, uh, was probably around, it was like the crucifixion was probably around 30-ish AD, plus or minus a few years. So he would have been born, Jesus was probably born four to six BC, which is kind of odd, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, and John was probably born around the same time. So if he's, you know, John's born around zero-ish, you know, plus or minus, he's in his 90s. Here's what's awesome, ready? When you're 90, 
you could still be with it and write something like this. That is good news that you, you, you could be still fun. Like you're still, oh man, he's in his 90s. He's writing the, the, you know, the, one of the most complicated and interesting books of the Bible, certainly of the New Testament. Um, he's on the island of Patmos. Uh, it's one of the Greek islands, but this is not like a vacation. It's not like he's on a cruise. It's a prisoner camp for Rome. So he's exiled by, uh, by the emperor Domitian during this time. And this is one of Domitian's favorite uh, punishment for Christians was to exile them. So he, he became a very, a very, a very fierce and strong persecutor of Christians. So the things that we often, we often kind of apply to Nero, we say, oh, Nero did this. Nero didn't, probably didn't do all of the crazy things we think about. Domitian did. So he would, he would cover you. If you're a Christian, you get uh, sentenced to death. He would cover you in oil and light you on fire and, and use you as a torch for his garden. Oh, he's that guy. He's the guy, he's the guy that would, that would you know, saw people in half and, and fillet their skin off. One of his favorites, though, was to exile people because death was too quick, it was too easy. So I'm gonna exile you to a prisoner camp for years and you're gonna experience tough life. John was exiled, probably not as a worker. He's 90-ish years old, but he's there to live out his days in exile, you know, famished. I mean, just, just poor, poor conditions. So it's on this island that he has this revelation. Here's what it says in, in uh, chapter one, verse nine. He says, this is how we know he was on Patmos. And, and we're even, he even tells us why. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, that I'm with you in the suffering. We're suffering this together. We're patiently enduring together. He says this, I was on the island of Patmos because, here's the reason, of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Here's what he's saying, ready? Because I was a Christian. Because I believed the word of God and had the testimony of Jesus and, and I was exiled and sentenced to go and live on this island of Patmos. So he tells us, all right, now, he's gonna have this vision and then he's gonna write this down and he's gonna write this, this book. But this book is, is complicated, it's it's, a genre, it's, it's written in a genre you've probably, you probably has very little experience or, or involvement with. It's actually three genres to make things even more complicated. And, uh, and so it's three, it's three writing styles in one. Here's the first one. It is called an apocalypse. In Greek, apocalypsis. It's the first word in Revelation. It's what John's gonna write. That this is an apocalypsis, which means unveiling or revealing. And, and so an apocalypse, an apocalyptic writing has, it has to do with this, a cosmic battle of good and evil. Hence, we get revelation. It's almost like you get a, a peek behind the spiritual curtain and you see what's going on in the spirit realm with regard to what's happening in real life because he's getting a vision and this, is, this has to do with this huge battle of good and evil. It's written to give readers hope. The reason you write an apocalypse isn't like, and everyone died and we lose. And so, you know, good night. <laughs> like, no, it, it, the goal is to provide hope to say, hey, listen, here's what's happening. Here's what's gonna happen. And in the end, it's gonna be good news. So he writes with a purpose of hope and it has highly, highly symbolic language. This again is why it's hard to interpret Revelation and, and many have, you know, interpreted different ways because depending on how literal you think it should be will change your understanding. But apocalyptic writing is extremely symbolic. So we'll look at here some symbols in the future in just uh, later on today. Um, but as we go through Revelation, you see that, that, that things are not what they are, but that they're seen as symbols or images or dragons or stars or a t you know, um, uh, eyes of fire or a, a mouth with a sword. And you're like, okay, these are clearly symbolic images that aren't meant to be taken literally. Um, but many will try to, and, and that's how you can get in, sometimes get into trouble when you take it so literally because you have to realize this genre is apocalyptic. It's, it's, think of it like this. Um, when, uh, uh, not that I have much experience in this, but poetry. I am, I don't know if you know this, I am an excellent poet. And I didn't know it. <laughs> so, so that's a terrible dad joke. But uh, poetry, if you read poetry, you don't read it literally. I love you to the moon and back. 
When, when did you go to the moon? I went, are you Gary? You, you went to the moon and then you came back for me? No, no, that's not what that means. We know that's not what that means. When we read Revelation, we see symbols like that. And when we take them literally, he, he's, oh, no, that's not what that means. You can't do that. So it's apocalyptic. Okay, it's also a prophecy. So John is going to tell us this is also a prophecy about what's to come. So it's apocalyptic, and it's this great you know, cosmic symbolism of, of this cosmic battle of good and evil. But it's also what's going to happen. Here's, what's, here's what has happened. Here's what is happening. And then here's what's going to happen. We'll see that next week as John gives us kind of an outline for the, the book of Revelation. And we, so we see that, that it is about, it's describing events to come. Now, here's what's crazy, though. Even though it's describing events to come, it is grounded. It is grounded in the Old Testament. That it, it is, that it has more Old Testament references and allusions than any other New Testament book. In fact, it might have more than all of them combined. So here's, here's the thing. Scholars have identified in the 404 verses in Revelation, there are over 500 references or allusions to Old Testament scriptures. Now, did John know his Bible? Oh, you better believe he did. John knew his Old Testament. In fact, he probably committed a lot of it to memory. And so as we read Revelation, as much as we say like, oh, it's, it's all about things in the future, hold on, hold on, it is grounded in what's happened in the past and, and the references from the Old Testament. If we do quick math, that means that there are about 1.25 Old Testament references or allusions for every verse in Revelation. Every verse has at least about, on average, one and a quarter Old Testament references. Many, many, this has kind of usually been the saying that a lot of, you know, preachers have had. I think when a theologian said this once, and so everyone uh, latched onto it, that the Bible is meant to be read in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Now, let me caution you with that, okay? As we do Revelation, some of us will think, like, you're supposed to read Revelation in one hand and get your newspaper, current events, in the other. The problem with that is that John wasn't writing about current events, about what is going to happen in 2024 you know, America, Western civilization. John is grounding Revelation in the Old Testament. Here's a, probably a more appropriate way to approach Revelation to say, you read Revelation in one hand, and you have the Old Testament scriptures in the other. And you're saying, all right, John, how are you using these to describe what's going on? As we go through Revelation, it's important that we're grounded not in the current events and like here's this thing and this happened and this guy said this was the next sign and it's a fulfillment. Okay, I, I understand all that. But John wasn't writing that way. An apocalyptics and a prophecy was not written like that. Like it's meant to be applied right now. Instead, we look backwards and say, This is what he's this is the illusion. This is the what he's talking about when he when he gives when he has this vision, he he connects it to this thing, which is totally different. Here's, here's, why it's hard. here's why I caution against the like revelation in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Um, every generation, every generation, literally every generation from the time after, right after the time of Jesus until now has said revelation applies to them. <laughs> every generation said, this is us. This is what we're going through. Clearly, he's writing about our time whether it be the Crusades, and they're going like, we're clearly, we're clearly fighting on the side of the good fight, and we're, we're fighting the, the, the uh, evil Muslims and Islam. We're trying to, like, all right, they're looking at Revelation going, we're ushering this in. Or, or you look at the time, certainly, the one that makes the most sense, that, that's probably closest to us, we say, man, the setting around World War II certainly looks and sounds a lot like what we're reading about in Revelation. There is a clear Antichrist favor. I mean, couldn't be more obvious. This has to be the Antichrist. It has to be. How could it not be? This Adolf Hitler who's targeting, literally targeting God's people, the Jews. He's going after God's people. Okay, this is clearly, clearly a, a, spiritual, a spiritual battle is going on here. And the whole world is at war. Th hundreds of thousands and millions of people are fighting and dying and you're reading Revelation and you're like, man, Jesus says things like, you know, the tribulation that the world has never seen before and never will again. You're going, World War II seems like it. We're still doing documentaries and watching shows and about World War II, about all the things that happened. And it's like, it's like, wow. And, and do you know what that wasn't? 
That wasn't this. That didn't end with the return of Christ like we thought it probably should have. Huh. World War II wasn't the fulfillment of Revelation. Okay, man, in, in, you know, in our in, in near experience of life, that, would, that seems to be the thing that would be the most likely candidate. And that wasn't it. Every generation has done this like, well, this is for us and it applies to us. Clearly, it's about our time. I caution you only because, ready? Every generation has been wrong up until ours. What's the likelihood that we're right? <laughs> that all of them have been wrong, and but somehow we nailed it. We got it right. So it is a prophecy describing events to come that were certainly future for John, but also rooted and grounded in the Old Testament in the past. And it's also a letter. It's a letter written to seven churches in Asia Minor. Now we're going to see here in a second, we're going to look at some of the kind of the symbolism behind the numbers, but it's written to specific churches, seven churches in Asia Minor that Jesus has a specific word for each one of them. Um, it, you can go to these churches, it's modern day Turkey now, and you can do the, you know, the tour, the seven churches uh, of, uh, of Revelation and go visit them, visit the, at least the cities. Um, but here's, here's, the, the, here's the time, here's what the, the culture they were, the, they were in, ready? They were under intense persecution by Rome. This emperor Domitian was enforcing severe persecution against Christians. One of the things that was alive and well was emperor worship. In fact, it was, it was, uh, it was the law. It was the, you had to do this. You had to claim that Caesar is Lord. You could see how that would be a problem for Christians who are saying, no, no, no. We don't serve Caesar as Lord. We have one God and Lord, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Well, Rome didn't like that. Rome didn't like that one bit. So one of the things they made you do, anytime you were accused of anything, you go before a court, and you had to say this. You had to say, you had to say Caesar is Lord. You had to give allegiance to Rome and Caesar and essentially worship Caesar as Lord, as God, as a God figure. If you didn't, then whatever, the, whatever, the, whatever you're accused of, whether you're guilty or not, they would then sentence you to the, the str most strictest punishment possible. Hey, this one is uh, accused of lying and not worshiping, uh, not worshiping Rome, or uh, he's accused of, uh, of trying to cause a riot because he preached outside maybe. All right, is this true? I'm, I'm innocent. All right, well, tell you what, how about you just real quickly say Caesar is Lord, give your allegiance, and then, and then we can go from there can't do that. You know what's going to happen. I can't do that. Jesus is Lord. All right. Well, maximum punishment for causing a riot is crucifixion. It is, uh, it is uh, death by stoning. It's uh, imprisonment at a camp. And that's what happened. They were under intense persecution. Listen, I know, I know that we feel like we've been persecuted. But if, if, if we take a step back and look at history, I don't want to insult real Christians who actually experience real persecution. We've, we, we certainly uh, have maybe rights trampled or, um, or violated, or it feels like we're targeted maybe because we're Christians and followers of Jesus, but not like this. You and I have no fear right now of, of, uh, of a police force coming in here and arresting us all because we're a church. They would. They'd be looking at the Roman guards and, oh, I don't know if we can show with me today. Ah, that sounds a little risky. All right. In fact, I don't even know. This is, I hope this isn't true, but if you and I were living in the first century, I don't know how many of us would be faithful to Jesus. Seeing that, oh, Susie down the street, you see what happened to her? Yeah, she was arrested. I, went, I never saw her again. She had to say bye to her kids. You see what happened to, to Jim? Yeah, I, he was crucified. Okay. But all because of his faith. Are we sure we want to do this? And they said, yes. You can kill us. You can kill our loved ones. We're not giving in. This is crazy. The amount of faith that they had was crazy. And the amount of persecution they were going through is just crazy, unfathomable. And it wasn't for just a few months. This is probably decades. It's probably 20 to 30 years at this point of this nonstop, nonstop. Yet Christianity is spreading like wildfire. They can't stop. Rome can't stop it. They're trying to kill every Christian and they kill one and two more pop up. And they're like, how are they doing this? And, and, and it's spreading like crazy. And, and so, so it's in this culture that John is writing this and he gets this, this revelation, he gets this vision and um, this series of visions and he writes them down for these churches in Asia. Now there's four major approaches to interpreting scripture or interpreting specifically Revelation. 
And, uh, and depending on where you land and what you're convinced of will determine kind of how you interpret the book of Revelation. So I'm gonna, it's, it's why people disagree. I'm also gonna say, let's rise above that. And we're gonna look at not like which one is right, who's right, who's wrong, but rather, all right, what can we learn and understand? The first is this, a futurist approach, which says that everything after chapter three is future and it waits future fulfillment. Certainly everything after chapter five. So chapter four and five, we kind of get a vision of heaven, of what God, God is like on the throne. Um, but, but all of Revelation then is future, future from our time, future for us, right? That's this futurist approach. It's a, it's a popular one. It's the, it's the Left Behind series. And then there's a preterist approach, which says that fulfillment is in the past, in the first century, especially around the events of 70 AD. 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. This was a big deal. In fact, in the history of, of Jews, this was one of the biggest deals. You go to Israel today, and you know the most holy site? You know where it is? It's the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, which is one of the original spots where the temple was. I mean, you can't, it's like you go there and you feel it. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is, a, it is a, 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 a holy space. It's because this is, I mean, the temple was destroyed. It was right here. And we still have this wall. So we go there and we, we can at least pray in front of this thing. So the temple is destroyed in 70 and there's a war that breaks out around that time. It ends with the temple being destroyed. You know, Rome ends up destroying the temple. Uh, of this, this seven-year war that breaks out. Um, from 66 to 73. And, uh, and a preterist will say the events of Revelation are describing that. It's actually passed for us. And then there's another view, an idealist view. There's no single fulfillment, but rather it's principles and recurring themes that happen throughout the life of the church age and Christians. And, and this is a, a, a word picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and all of the battles that's happening around us. So an idealist view would, would not say like, oh, well, this is what it means. It would say, well, there's been antichrist throughout the history of the church for generations, which is true, by the way. Peter talks about, uh, and John talk about an antichrist, but they also talk about multiple antichrists. They would say, you've heard about the antichrist, and yet m- many, many antichrists have already come into the world. So that it would be like, all right, there's no one single fulfillment. There's multiple, all right? And then there's a historist view, which Revelation surveys the whole of church history. And they would say, well, this lines up with this and this lines up with this. And they would look at church history and say, this isn't just idealist of, of all times, but, but it has its fulfillment, but it's not a seven-year period. It's not, it's not this period in the past. It's not this period in the future. It actually represents the entire church age. Revelation spans a whole bunch of time. Now, here's the thing about Revelation. Ready? How long is the tribulation gonna last? You guys know? Seven years. Okay, right? That shows up nowhere in Revelation. It shows up nowhere in the New Testament. This idea of a seven-year period, it shows up in Daniel in just one passage. And it depends on how you translate it to get this seven-year period. So right or wrong, right? There's arguments on both sides. When you read, when you read Revelation, um, it, doesn't t- it doesn't say, hey, this is a seven-year period. Here's what's gonna happen. So Revelation doesn't even give you a clue to to when it's happened or how how long it's going to happen or the time gap between. So again, it adds to the confusion and you can see why people would translate or interpret this so many different ways. All right, now there's three ways to read scripture and and I'm gonna, there's two bad ones and one good one. Okay, here they are, ready? Not just revelation, but just scripture. In general, here's how you interpret scripture. Here's how you read scripture, study scripture. Okay, the first one, the right one, is called exegesis. Exegesis means you Take the meaning out of, X from the text. You read the text and you let it say, you pull meaning out of it. So you read the Bible and say, I'm gonna let the Bible tell me what it says. I'm gonna interpret the scriptures with the scriptures, right? This is the, good, this is the, the, the goal of every good Bible reader, interpreter, preacher, theologian, commentary, you, people, you, everyone read it, wanting to read the scriptures. I wanna know what it means. That's exegesis. And then there's another one called eisegesis. Eisegesis is this. I decide what it means. I put meaning into the text. So I've already decided this is true and I'm gonna happen. Oh, I just so happen to find it in the Bible. This is what you do. This is what happens when people pull verses out of context or move things around. And you can, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. Well, this verse connects to this verse, connects to this word. And so therefore I'm right. And you're going, you just made all that up, Right? You're putting meaning into the text that wasn't originally there, all right. And then there's a third one, and this one is kind of tongue in cheek, but it happens all the time, ready? So there's exegesis, the good one, eisegesis, don't do that, and then there's narcissus. 
where you, as a narcissist, are saying, no, no, not only am I putting meaning into the text, I'm putting myself into it. It's about me. And this passage, this promise, this truth that I just read, actually, God, I think you actually wrote that to me. And that's for me. Here's an example, and I don't want to throw shade, but you know, I, I, I was guilty of this as well. A um, number of years ago, there was a book that came out called The Prayer of Jabez. You remember that? You guys buy that? Anybody still reading it? Anybody still praying the prayer of Jabez? No, it lasts about six months. Okay, the prayer of Jabez was, there's an Old Testament prayer, and if you prayed this prayer, it would happen to you. And this prayer was like, expand my reach, expand my territory, give me more influence. And you're like, oh, that's written about me. Yeah. And what you did, what we did, what I did too. I'm reading this, you know, as a young Christian going like, yeah, yeah. Is I'm putting myself and saying, this is about me and for me and a promise to me. And it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> and we move on. Many of us will read Revelation as a narcissist Jesus. This is the Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other, in which we're saying, clearly, this is about our time. It's about our time. No one else is. Every other generation has been wrong, but it is about our time. Now, maybe it is, but I just want to say, let's just be cautious. Let's just be cautious before we just say, well, clearly, this is about 2024, the state of America. North, in North America, a continent they didn't even know existed back then. But it's clearly written about us. Now, I just, do we, we want to pause. The Bible was written, here's another thing, ready? The Bible was written for us, but not to us. Well, who was, written, uh, who, who was re Revelation written to? Seven churches in Asia. It was written to a specific group of people, specific believers at a specific time period, at like a specific locations. It is written to these seven churches, but it's for all of us. So it's written to them in their context. They have a message. Jesus has a message for them, yet it's written for all of us. We read it and we say, all right, this is for our benefit. Though it wasn't written to me, it was written for me. I heard another pastor say it this way, and this is really helpful, that it can't, that revelation, it can't mean to us what it didn't mean to them. There can't be a special hidden meaning only for us, the privileged few, that they didn't have, that John is writing this letter to them, this, this revelation, and he says, here you guys go. It's supposed to be for your encouragement. Here you go. Pass this around to all the churches. There's a blessing when you read this. And oh, and also, none of this is going to happen for thousands of years Good luck. It can't be that there's a secret hidden code. And if you guys have ever studied this or know about this, the Bible code, and it's like the secret code that you gotta decipher. No, 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 listen. It was written in a specific time and place for specific people. It can't mean to us some secret hidden message that it didn't mean to them. Now, it could have meant to them and they didn't understand it fully, absolutely, but we don't get to just make things up and say, well, I think Revelation says this. Who cares what you think it says? I wanna know what it means, and I wanna use scripture to help me understand scripture. Okay, some symbolism. We'll go through these quickly because we'll spend some time throughout the series. Um, some symbolism in apocalyptic literature. Here we go, ready? The number, there's, especially with numbers. Numbers, here we go. The number four is this, full and total coverage, especially in view of God's creation. Hence the four winds or the four corners of the earth. Four corners of the earth, clearly, clearly the Bible's preaching a flat earth because there are corners. So it has to, it has to be flat. You read that and go, no, that's not what that means. It means all of the earth, right? The four corners of the earth or the directional. All right, so it's, it's symbolic. It's not meant to be taken literally. Six is this, it's incompleteness. Seven, we see, is perfection and completeness. Seven is the perfect number, and it, so we'll see seven all over the place, right? There's seven churches. It's written in seven churches, which is then representing, all right, this is written for the whole church. It's written to these guys, but it's written for everyone. There's seven, uh, there's seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls and seven lampstands, and there's even, we're going to see this, a seven spirit being person, the sevenfold spirit, and, and you're going, okay, there's sevens all over the place. There's, the chapters are written in seven. Like seven is just, is all over. So when you see seven, you realize, oh, okay, this probably isn't just a literal number, seven. It means something else. And six is one before that. It's an incomplete number, right? Hence, hence the mark of the beast is six, six, six. It's a trinity of, ready, of incompleteness. 
It's sixes that don't represent. It's a, it's the, the mark of the beast is a mockery of God. Oh, you got your mark? You got your way to the Holy Spirit seal them? All right, well, we'll seal them with, with our own version of a mark. All right. So whatever the mark of the beast is, it is a direct mockery of who God is based on the symbolism of, of being incomplete. We see that uh, 10 is something that is extreme but limited. It's large. This is a, a dragon with 10 heads. And, um, and we'll see, uh, well, you see the number 10 show up all over the place. Um, we see that 12 is the, uh, the perfection of God's people, that the number 12 is in relation, not just the number of like perfection of seven, but it refers to, now we're talking about God's people, hence the 12 tribes. There were 12 apostles or disciples. We see that even the, the number 144,000 is 12 twelves of a thousand. We see the number a thousand. So the next one, the number of a thousand is a great amount or a long period of time. Again, if you take it literally, which you can do and say like, oh, it must mean this. But in apocalyptic literature, it means something else. So, so we see 12 twelves of thousands. It means that there is, for God's people, there are 12 tribes of 12,000. Okay, this is, it might not be an actual 144,000, but it could be a large group of people representing the 12 tribes. And it means something different because, again, it's highly symbolic. All right. Now some themes. We'll do some themes and then we'll get into our verses and we'll wrap up. It'll be fairly quickly, but you're gonna, it's like, whoa, what did we just, we just, we just, it probably feels like today, like we just merged onto the freeway. We were going zero, and now, like within a matter of minutes, we're going 70 miles an hour. All right, that's what this feels like, and I get it, but here we go, okay? Some themes of Revelation. First is the sovereignty of God, that God is supreme and has authority and control over all. We're gonna see this, that throughout the book of Revelation, the, the encouragement is this God is in control. We see this. The victory of Christ shows up over and over. The central, one of the central themes is the victory of Jesus over sin and death and all the forces of evil. That as, as overwhelming as that may be, we see, man, it, every time I read an end, it ends with the victory of Jesus, with the victory of the Lamb. We see this, that it's about judgment and justice, that it portrays the, God's righteous judgment against sin and he's pouring out judgment on people who won't repent. This is, the, this is the part of the book it's known, the theme it's known for. This is what makes it scary and people go, I don't know if I wanna read about it because you're reading about the judgments that God pours out. It's about hope and perseverance, hope in the future, hope in the, in the lamb, hope in, in our future and perseverance to endure. He who endures to the end will be saved. And so there's a level of like, all right, all right, there's a perseverance that has to happen here. In the midst of their intense persecution, he says, endure because there is a hope that we have. And we see this, there's a theme of a new creation. The book, it, it culminates in the new creation with a new heaven and a new earth where God will dwell with his people forever. And in the end, this is why the Revelation is such encouragement because it, it, it goes through this whole process, this whole period, and at the end, God wins and we are with him. And this is incredible. This is, this is what, this is, what like, is so cool. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is good news. It's great news. It means all of the good stuff, all the good passages that are in, the, in Revelation, they're for you. They're for us. Blessed, blessed is the one who's invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I can't wait to be at that. I'm gonna be stuffing my face and like you guys are gonna be like showing. I'm like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. I'm just having this, this is the greatest meal ever. Like, man, there's gonna be a moment, a time where we actually are with the Lord together. Man, we, this is incredible. If you aren't a follower of Jesus, then Revelation is and should be scary. It should cause, it should cause some pause in your life to say, all right, if this really is true, I, I don't wanna be on the wrong, I don't wanna be on the wrong team here. I wanna be on the right side of this. So here we go, Revelation chapter one, verse one. Here's what we're gonna see. Revelation is a divine message from Jesus meant to bless us. It's meant to bless you. Revelation is meant to be a blessing. There are seven verses that, that, call, that said that there are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. Again, another representative number. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. This revelation, this apocalypse, this apocalypsis from Jesus is from Jesus the, that God gave him and, he, and he, whatever soon means, he's showing what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And here it is, the blessing. 
Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because, he says it again, the time is near. Blessed are those who read this letter and who take to heart what it says because the time is near, that there is a blessing in, in studying and reading Revelation. It's why as a church, we're not, gonna ever, we're not gonna ever neglect any part of the Bible, certainly not this one, because I don't wanna rob you of the blessing. <laughs> So we will be blessed together as we go through Revelation. Here's the next thing we see. Revelation is given out of Jesus' love for us. John now intros this letter with an official title, an official kind of opening. Here's what he says. Here's his greeting. John, to the seven churches in America. No, uh, that's, sorry, my typo, quick. To the seven churches in the province of Asia. So he's writing to. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was, and who is to come. We're gonna see three persons now mentioned. This one who is, and was, and is to come is a reference now. We're already getting some biblical references, some allusions to the Old Testament. This is now specifically a reference to God, the eternal God who is, who was, who is, and who is to come. So he's saying, all right, grace and peace to you from God the Father. God, who is God? The one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. And then he says this, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Seven spirits. Now, you could look at this and say, all right, seven spirits. There must be seven angels that circle the throne. Or this is apocalyptic, and you realize this means something different. In fact, many commentators will say the proper translation, I think even in your Bibles, they have a footnote that says, this isn't seven spirits, but this is the sevenfold spirit. And, and they'll even liken it to when, when, uh, when uh, in Elijah, when it says, um, when it describes the spirit of the Lord, and it gives seven different descriptions. That this isn't probably seven actual angelic beings, but this is the sevenfold spirit. Ready? This is describing the Holy Spirit. So he's writing this and he says, grace and peace to you from God the Father, from the sevenfold spirit before the throne, from the Holy Spirit. All right, see what's going on here, right? Seems to be like a reference to what we call the Trinity. Who do you think's next? Who do you think? If this was right, who do you think would be next in this pattern? Let's just read. Let's just see. Here's what it says. And from Jesus Christ. Ah, knew it, knew it who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he says, this, this comes not from the authority of John. This greeting is not just for me. This is grace and peace from God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. This, is, this level of authority that, that John is writing from is not his own. He's saying, hey, this is from God himself to us. And it says this, to him now, and he's gonna describe the him the one who loves us, to him who loves us and has freed us from sin by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. John emphasizes this ongoing nature of of Jesus' love and he says, to him now, I'm gonna give glory and honor forever and ever. And here's here's the hymn, ready? To him who loves us who sacrificed himself, who freed us from sin by his blood and then makes us a part of his kingdom and then makes us priests to go serve him forever. This this is the mission now that you and I have. This is why, this is why Revelation isn't meant to just be like, you read and learn of all the dates and figure it all out, I got the timeline. No, no, this is meant to put courage into your spine so you can say, I'm a priest and it's my job to represent Jesus everywhere I go. I don't know if you know this. Everywhere you go, you represent God. And people are watching you. If they know you're a Christian, they're watching you with a little side eye, with a raised eyebrow going, all right, are you really one of them? How are you living? You are living as a representative of who Jesus is, not just Sunday morning when you dress nice and you come to church and everything's great, but when you're at work and when you're at home and when you're with your neighbors and when you're out and like, all right, all right, I'm gonna live out It's Jesus who loves me and brought me in his kingdom and made me a priest. Okay, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Not Caesar, not Caesar is Lord, but to this one, to him, glory and power forever and ever. And then we see this, Jesus reassures, reassures us that Jesus, a revelation reassures us that Jesus is coming back. Revelation tells us yet again, hey, Jesus is coming back. Back And this is all the events that are gonna be surrounding that. Here's what he says in verse seven. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. These are all references to the Old Testament. 
This one coming on the clouds, this is Daniel. The, the people will mourn because of him. This is Zechariah. So it shall be, amen. And then we see this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. Another Old Testament reference. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. All right, another Old Testament reference. All right, here's the equivalent today. I am the A and the Z. Those are, Alpha and Omega are the Greek letters of the Greek alphabet, the first and the last one. He's saying, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm everything. I'm the beginning and the end, and I, I encompass all of it. I am the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And I am telling you, he's coming back. So here's for us. Here's what this means. It means trust in the internal nature of Jesus. It means no matter what you face, God is present with you. He always has been and always will be. And we see this, that this truth should anchor our soul in times of uncertainty. Here's the point. Ready? We'll end with this. God wants you to have courage in a world full of evil. In a culture, their culture, full of evil. This was written to give them courage. What do you know? Our culture isn't much better. <laughs> that we have a culture that is also, that is also seems to be bent against Jesus, against Christianity, against anyone claiming to have any kind of insight or understanding of who God is or who Jesus is, that Jesus is Lord. If you say Jesus is Lord now, you might not be sent to jail, but you could lose your job. You could face, you could, you could face consequences because of your faith in Jesus. The goal of Revelation for them and for us is the same, to give us courage in a world full of evil, a, a world full of discouragement. I pray and hope that as we go through this book together, we will, we will be encouraged. It will cause us to, to want to live differently, to experience God's goodness in a new way and experience, and to experience this blessing together. Would you do this? Would you stand with me? And then we're going to worship this, this Lord here together. So Lord, we thank you we thank you for who you are and we, we come before you humbly as one seated on the throne of which we're gonna read about. Help us to understand more about you, of who you are, how you're moving in our lives and how we can take courage. This summer as we spend time in, in this vision that you gave John, will you anchor our soul your goodness and your glory. We thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we contemplate